Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat 132, featuring the fourth and final part of my interview with Mr. Mark Soderwall. In this part of the interview, we talk about his uh, most recent projects. We talk about Fracture. We talk about his time at LucasArts, uh, making the Star Wars games, Force Unleashed and the uh, Clone Wars. A lot of great stuff. We also talk about the importance of game history. And I think you'll see in this video just how amazingly well read Mr. Soderwall really is. It's very impressive. And then uh, we also talk about what it takes uh, to prepare yourself for a career as a graphics artist, making a living in the video games industry. A lot of great, great stuff. I know you guys are going to enjoy this. So without further ado, here is Mr. Mark Soderwall. Well, let's talk about one of your favorite games, our favorite game projects. You had mentioned a fracture mm -hmm. you know, a while ago, and you said this was a, it's a very innovative game, uh, but on the other, uh, it went through all kinds of tumultuous changes, you know, as, this, as the development went on. So can you talk a little bit about what happened with uh, Fracture? Yeah, Fracture was a very unique game in a sense that, uh, you know, it, it, going back to that, that one-line hook on a box cover for the first time ever X, uh, for the first time ever you can use terrain deformation to get tactical advantage, um, you know, in a shooter game. And that's really awesome. So, I mean, imagine playing like Call of Duty or... Medal of Honor or something like that to where all of a sudden you can just, you know, drop the floor out from underneath an opponent, you know, or you can all of a sudden just create a duck blind out of a mound of dirt in front of you instantly, you know, that's that's absorbing shots while you're either reloading or you're you're thinking of a strategy. Um, you know, that was the premise of a fracture. And very cool mechanic. We based a lot of a lot of the games based on that. You know, this terrain deformation. So all the weapons were designed to have you know all types and the grenades and and, and the vehicles all had these different ways of deforming the terrain. And it was really cool. Uh, the game was very physics based, obviously because you're able to you know, uh, move the topology up and down, and you know, things would have to react accordingly. So there's a lot of physics involved. Um, the game originally started out as a first-person shooter, so you know all you kind of had was you know typical FPS where you've got your hands and your gun in front of your face, um, and you know maybe you'd see the upper you know the, the lower arm every time you'd kick the gun up and reload a clip and come down, but you never saw the character except in a cutscene or something like that. And uh, going along, you know, a number of months into uh, production. Uh, you know, uh, George Lucas and, uh, you know, I, I think a few others kind of had the idea of, hey, you know what, this game's got a really rich story, and uh, the story very much is revolved around the main character who you play, who's Jet Brody, um, but I really don't feel connected to him, because I can't see him, right? So it's just like, so let's make the game third person. And let's see the character. And it's just like, okay, so that kind of turned development on a little sideways for a few months while we had to, you know, kind of break things and, and put pieces back together, um, which, you know, was, was, a, was a challenge for sure. And then we go through the whole rigor of, uh, you know, testing out the character, you know, his uniform, his hairstyle. I mean, it, it got really detailed. I mean, we went through about a good month or so. I'm just trying to figure out hairstyles for this guy. I mean, forget what his, what his armor looks like. It's just like, are we going to be satisfied with his hair? We went through a lot of green light groups and focus test groups on just his hairstyle. And it was, and it still didn't come out right. We still George got... Lucas that was focused on the hair? I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> How did... I'm not going there. But anyways, uh... <laughs> So, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, and then it's like, do we give him the mystery scar, you know, like an Anakin Skywalker <laughs> or, uh, you know, how, how do we deal with this? You know, do we make him African-American? Do we keep him white? Do we, you know, throw in some other kind of, you know, mutt mix of, of whatever? And it just got very convoluted. But I will say um, I did appreciate the fact that it, that it did go third person uh, because um, just from an art directional standpoint, a visual standpoint, uh, it allowed us to actually have some scale uh, reference, um, whereas in first-person shooter, you know, your your gun and your hands are so close to you, and especially when you're deforming terrain or you're, you know, you're, you're, um, you know, doing all the stuff with the environment, you really don't have a sense of scale of how big that pit is or how big that that duck blind that you created is per se. But now, with the character pulled back and you're behind him, so to speak. Um, 
now you get a now you get a wider field of view. Your you know um, your peripheral is a lot more open. Um, you know, and, and you get a sense of scale a lot better because you're you're now able to measure everything against your character. So you you know you you see your character is about six foot, and so you notice when you're building up these stalagmites or you know you're depressing the ground and you're having to tunnel through or whatever. Yeah, you know, like I said, it gives you a real good sense of scale, which creates I think a little bit more immersion, and you're able to uh, have a better experience. But uh, yeah, it was a it was a fun production. It it was, but it was. It had a lot of challenges, a lot of feature creeping, and um, a lot of technical issues, lighting, um, physics. So, uh, you know, we wanted to add in a lot of scripted elements, which basically means they're, those are like triggered elements. Um, but we had to make sure that once you went over a trigger and something happened, that it's still um, laid out correctly so that it didn't break the pathing, so you couldn't complete the mission, you know, because you were now obstructed, so there were ways around it. So. A lot of testing went into the game. A lot of testing. Now, a while ago, you said that you consider yourself an artist and, and a fine artist. And I was uh, thinking about something John Hare and I had talked about when, back when I interviewed him. And, and he was uh, really upset because he said, you know, unlike a movie producer or unlike, a, I guess in, in your case, a, a painter or something, you know, my old games are obsolete and nobody cares about them anymore. You know, they just, you know... I. You wouldn't see uh, one of his games in the Louvre, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> uh, or you know, in his opinion. So I'm just kind of wondering, you know, what what are your thoughts on this? Do you look at some of your older games and and think, wow, that was really that looks like crap, <laughs> or do you, uh, um, you know, how do how do you contemplate this? Again, it's all uh, it's all relative. You know, you can go back and look at uh, the horse and buggy. You know, or look at some of the the early you know Ford cars that came out. You know, with the big spoked wheels, and uh, you know they're very boxy, and you know they actually had the the candlelit lamps on the sides. You know, and, and different things like that, as opposed to you know a Lamborghini Countach today or a Vector or something of that nature. You know, it's just like everything has its place. And art, in and of itself, again, is is a very subjective thing, but it. But it needs to be appreciated for what it is, um, you know. And while I don't appreciate, you know, or or necessarily like all art, I have an appreciation to it, to its creativity, to its evolution, um, to uh, its dynamic, um, how it was created, um, you know. But I'm I'm finding more and more that there, you know, the industry, believe it or not, is has come full circle, in my opinion. What started out with eight bit graphics and sprite art where are we now Matt we're, we're right back at sprite art with mobile games you know um, and we're, we're back at low polygon uh, type of art with you know uh, mobile titles and you know social games which use you know very vector based or sprite based artwork um, you know even though we've got again the modern warfares out there that are absolutely gorgeous and the skyrims which are just deep and immersive um, you know, right alongside is their kin of these sprite games. So I think the appreciation's coming back. I don't, I don't think it's dead or, or lost at all. It's come full circle, and it's finding a new market and a new appreciation. And it's, it's a sad testament, but I can actually say that I actually lived through a full cycle, <laughs> um, you know, and experienced a full cycle um, of the gaming industry, and uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. I'm just wondering, sort of, as an artist, you know, which one of your projects are you the most proud of that you would want to direct somebody to? Uh, um, boy, well, huh. you know, I'd, I'd have to say one of obviously the newer ones, um, you know, like Star Wars: The Force Unleashed, um, or you know, even even Clone Wars, um, to some degree, uh, was was really great. The thing I liked, you know, most about about Clone Wars is it was so stylized, you know, um, everything was was stylized about that game. Um, in fact, when we were starting to develop the game, um, we actually took a, I, I set up a meeting over at Lucas Ranch with the actual uh, directors and producers of Clone Wars, the actual animated series, and sat down with them and just really got into their head and said, you know, what makes these characters, what makes the story, what makes these visual elements, you know, come alive? What are the most important contours to understand so we can interpret that correctly into the game? Um, you know, I mean, if you look at the textures of the of the show, I mean, the texture is almost relief. 
you know, you can actually see the brush strokes in them. They weren't refined, they weren't polished. It was meant to be distressed. It was meant to, to have these characteristics. Even the models of the characters, well, some edges were very, you know, um, smooth and, uh, you know, fluid. Others, like Ben Kenobi's beard, were very uh, jagged, you know, and, and had very distinct edges. So it was always this, this continual back and forth of, you know, um, style, which was, which was really great. You know, and even the animation, you know, I, I, I really didn't care for the animation all that much. I thought it was very sticky and, and too fast. Um, you know, it's like, God, why couldn't you guys make things a little more fluid and maybe even motion capture? And again, the director was saying, it's like, we wanted everything to be stylized, all the way down to the textures, to the models, even to the animation. We wanted it to have its own universe and its own place. And I really appreciated that. I mean, even the lighting, you know, the lighting, which is beautiful and is ambient, and it was, it was, it was really great, um, you know wasn't hyper real as well it, it had its own stylization its own atmospherics to it and um you know so that was really great that was a huge learning experience for me um even in the, even as an art director you know um going in and talking with other talent and finding out what you know what they were realizing in their vision just inspired me and made me better um, and empowered me to take that vision and, and try and realize it as much as i could into the game all right, so just wrapping up here, I've just had a couple last questions. Sure. Uh, one is, you know, what do you say to the 16-year-old or, the, you know, the high school kid that comes up to you and says, you know, Mark, I want to be you. I want to do what you do. This is my life's ambition. You know, how, to, what can I be doing right now, you know, to prepare myself uh, for this career? Or you just tell them, forget about it or <laughs> stay away? Or, you know, what, what is your advice? Really, my advice would be to... Um, you know, if they're an artist, they're they're always going to be an artist. Um, you know, they're going to continually work on their skills and so on and so forth, and that's all I'm fine. And you know, I, I'd have advice to to tell them by way of that per se. But really, um, you know, if they if they want to get in the industry, start working with the games that have modding tools. You know, start um, you know start downloading some of these engines, these Unities and these UDKs and these Crytex and you know whatever. Start working with Blender. Start working with, you know, a lot of these free tools. Go on Google, you know, and get really basic in your search and find some of this stuff and download it. Um, you know, as a student right now, you got nothing but time. That's all you have. And, and passion and drive. So, you know, use it. Use it to your advantage, you know. And if it's something that you're not already learning in school, well, then teach yourself it, you know, uh, at home. Because there's a lot of accessibility to, again, these tools that I'm talking about. Um, you know, in your art classes, you know, start taking uh, a look at uh, at lighting. Lighting is very important, especially by the time they come to the gaming industry. I mean, goodness, we think what we're realizing now is amazing. I can only imagine what it's going to be like in, you know, five years, six years. It's, it's going to be crazy. But, you know, lighting, uh, lighting is next gen, to be quite honest. Um, you know, I was asked a question once, you know, what's the most important thing in a game you know, um, for me personally, animation is one, but right on par with that is lighting. Um, you know, because that just sets the mood for everything. Um, you know, and uh, so those are those would be things that I'd focus on. Start working with the tools that are available to you now. Start modding. Start building. Start getting an understanding of design and uh, you know pacing and story um, and putting that new game experience and start creating your own tabletop games you know, is really important. I still know designers in the industry right now that actually, if they can't realize a game in a tabletop version, it's out the door. They won't. They really? Won't do yeah, yeah. It's, it's why, awesome. Why is that? Um, you know, I, it might just be a style thing. Um, you know, they might just be, uh, you know, because it's it's easy for them to, to realize a very fundamental mechanic. You know, it's like if it can't be, you know, realized, you know, on a tabletop, if it can't be understood, at least at that level, um, then, you know, it's going to probably take a lot of work, potentially, to get the, the player to learn it in-game. Um, you know, no matter what kind of tools or, or whatever you throw at them, it's like, it's kind of their litmus test. Not all designers, but some designers. It's, it's, their, it's their ability to say, yeah, this, this, this mechanic is too difficult, or this design, or this feature is, I can't do it here, I'm not going to even try and do it on the computer, or, or so on and so forth. But then you know you have the other you have the other crowd that's like, 
you know, sky's the limit, you know, let's, let's just throw everything we can into the game until it chokes, you know, and then we'll start pulling stuff away. Um, so, you know, it's just game development. There are best practices, but even in that, some practices don't work for everybody. How important is it to have a sense of gaming history and to know really early games? Uh, I think it's, I think it's very important. Um, you know, because it's like, you know, at the end of the day, Matt, honestly, uh, a game, people play a game because it's fun, right? They, they want an experience. I can watch a movie and get artwork. You know, I can watch a movie and get visuals or sound, or I can listen to, you know, you know, MP3s or whatever and get great audio or, or whatever. But games is is really it's it's about the experience. And um, oh, dude, I totally just forgot what the question was. I started I started going. I started and I'm like I'm there I'm having this dilemma in my mind it's like okay I can either talk and just completely go off subject and just you know or I could just sit there and be like Matt what was the question again oh uh, the uh, question was uh, how important is it to be familiar with uh, the history of gaming and the okay the all right older games. That's, where I was going. that's where I was going I just I took a little long to, to land the plane history of gaming is really really essential because of the fact that you know ultimately the gaming experience needs to be fun. It needs to be immersive. You have to enjoy it. You know, I mean, artwork can be great. It can be beautiful. The sound could be amazing. Uh, you know, uh, there could be a, a one-trick pony game. You know, where it's like all it is is just this one mechanic. But if it's not fun, and you know, if all the game has is artwork or all the game has is audio or whatever, it's going to get tired after a while. You know, there's got to be a compelling reason to continue to go into it. The funny thing is, it's like back in old school days with coin ops and, and early games, they didn't have a lot of graphics. You know, they didn't have a lot of horsepower concerning visuals and audio and different things like that. The only thing they had to rely on was mechanics and gameplay and story to some degree. And so I think if you go back and you have an understanding of the limitations that they had, they had to do what they could do very well. And that was mechanics and that was gameplay. So what might not necessarily be the same kind of gameplay now, um, there are still things that you can extract from there, experiences that you can extract, uh, methodologies and philosophies and, and, and designs that you can still take at a very you know uh, basic level and put it into next-gen games now or even mobile games or, or whatever now and build on it. Because those are great foundations back then. Um, and, you know, it's like one of the things that I hear constantly in the industry, and this might be a surprise to a lot of you, is the fact that usually people that develop games, you know, at EA or, or Atari or, you know, THQ or Activision or whatever, a lot of people don't really, they're not gamers. They don't play a lot of games. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say a high percentage of them, but there's definitely a, you know, a very you know, good percentage of people that really don't, they're not hardcore gamers, you know, they're artists, they're animators, they're, they're designers, you know, designers typically do play more games, you know, obviously, because it's, it's part of their profession. I could explain but, a lot of games I've played. <laughs> well, yeah. But the thing is, is at least for me, and I can only say, I can only talk personally about my own experiences. A lot of times you get into the mindset, well, you know, I'm developing a game, so I, I know it. I know it's fun, you know, because I'm developing it, you know, and, and not that it's. Uh, I'm gonna tell you what's fun. It's it's not that at all. But it's it's the, it's the uh, it's the impression that you get that because you're developing, you somehow know what's a good game, what's not a good game. And to me, I only had this revelation maybe about four or five years ago. I'm ashamed to say that I realized that I wasn't playing as much as I was. Well, one, I was, I was busy, I have a family, you know, and so there's a, there's a balance there, of course. Um, you know, developing games is a long time. And, uh, you know, I, I, somehow I fell out of love with playing games just because I had other priorities take, you know, position over that, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but you still have to touch games. You still have to understand what makes them fun, you know, a lot of different genres, you know, don't try and get pigeonholed into one particular genre. It's not that you can't have a love for it, but, you know, explore, you know, diversify. Um, I'm playing everything right now, to be quite honest with you, and, and not that I have to fully see a game from start to finish. I, I still don't have time to do that. 
But I do try and touch and, and stay in touch with people that have played the games. I get a lot of referrals from colleagues and friends that's like, oh, Mark, you got to download this from Steam. You know, just try the trial version. It's really cool. And, you know, trial versions are usually pretty good. I can usually pretty get a, get a good sense of where the game's going. The, the core fundamentals and mechanics are there. I can, I can glean from. But having a history of games, and this is where I appreciate you, Matt, so much, is the fact that you... You know, you have such a passion for that, you know, your, your history of games and, and whatever. And actually, there it is. I actually still have this. So. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> you know, wow. I've read, it, I've read it, and I think it's, I think it's wonderful. It, it was very nostalgic, and it, it brought me back to a lot of childhood memories. And it, it, it bubbled up passion again of, of when I used to step into the arcade and... Ooh, the smell of it, you know, and the sounds, and, you know, it's very Tron-like, right? And um, it was just cool. And so, you know, I, I want to I want to make sure that I never lose that spirit. I never lose that experience. And so I'm always constantly looking back. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm somehow not innovative, but, you know, you need to look back at history in order to learn from it and, and appreciate the experiences so you can move forward better educated and better aware. So that's that's my philosophical tip right there. Oh, thank you. I think you've done your part here to help educate <laughs> people about the history of the industry. Really appreciate it, Mark. Is there anything you wanted to add or that we haven't talked about? A website uh, or something you want to point people to? Well, no, I mean, other than Game Creators well, um, you know, it's it's facebook.com uh, slash Game Creators Ball. Um, uh, like I said, it's just a really great community. Um, Full of gamers, full of developers, full of indies, full of students. Um, it's just a grab bag of like-minded individuals um, that are there just to, to share and to talk about best practices. Um, there's news, there's reviews, there's interviews. Um, I've done a lot of uh, I've done a lot of just clips, even on my iPhone, where I've just turned the darn thing around and I've just filmed myself at Starbucks talking about a best practice concerning like you know where to place the camera in a game and how to build your art pipeline around that um, you know and, and just different you know little three minute five minute topics that are just these little quick bits of information that are inspiring and, and you feel empowered and you kind of walk away with them and it's just like it motivates you and you know makes you want to think of things different or, or whatever and the site's full of that it really is and it, it's just it's great. I, I love it. So I really encourage you know everybody that's watching this to to go to Game Creators Vault you know on Facebook. It's a it's a group there, and so like the page, and we'll keep it updated. Yeah, excellent. I'll definitely post uh, the links to all that in the show notes, so anybody's curious will just click. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you very much. It's been great. Wonderful chat. Yeah. Wonderful uh, interview. This is actually yeah. my second time interviewing Mark. We <laughs> 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 yeah, it was a while ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it was back. I don't. It was a couple years ago, right? Or yeah, least, uh, yeah. So I was wearing GDC. a leather jacket and and yeah, it was a cool glasses jacket. and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I was. It was a little prima donna. So I've I've kind of gotten a lot more humbled since then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so well. working working at Lucas Arts will do that to you. Um, you know, it's just uh, you know when I when I got hired there, you know. Art directing, that was, that was a dream come true, being able to work at, at LucasArts and, and whatever. But, uh, you know, I felt pretty good walking, you know, up, the, up through the elevator. And then when I got into the studio and I'm walking down the off, I'm walking down the hallway to my office and I'm seeing these floor to ceiling murals of just the most epic artwork ever, you know, and, and walking past, you know, cubicles of artists that are just mind-blowingly good. And talented, and by the time I got to my office, I was like that big. <laughs> I was just like, I was so not that I went in there with a with a big head and was being a jerk or anything. I, I understand, but I mean, it's just like I'm just like, wow, this place is amazing, um, you know. And I, I honestly had a moment there to where I sat down in my chair and I just kind of was, was reflecting and was like, what in the world do I have to offer <laughs> all these people out there, you know, kind of a thing. But uh, it worked out. It was it was great. You know, obviously there was there was a lot of experience that I had, and you know, again, a lot of great artists out there, and, and I was able to, you know, be able to communicate my ideas visually, and they kind of took it from there and launched it into something that was epic. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the best practices that I've kind of been sharing here. Um, you know, again, a lot of them are artists, and a, and a lot of them are still new to the industry, so there was a lot that that I could still deposit, and so. 
you know, as intimidating as it was, I, I did find that I was still able to contribute in, in this great relationship form. So, um, you know, if you've got a passion for something, you know, just continue to move forward. Um, once you kind of break through the intimidation factor and you kind of get on the inside, you'll come to find out that the industry and the people in the industry are just like you. They, you know, they put their pants on one leg at a time. You, you prick them, they'll bleed. You know, they're just people. Um, and so, you know, don't, don't let it intimidate you because you're full of good ideas and full of talent and passion. So let that drive you. Understand that there's tools out there to allow you to realize that. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'll be back next week with a brand new retrospective. Now, I haven't picked the game yet, so if you guys have uh, suggestions, I'll be happy to take them into consideration. Actually, if I get enough uh, suggestions, I was uh, planning to uh, put them in my <laughs> drinking horn here and just pull one out at random, so uh, that'd be kind of interesting. So if you do have uh, some good ideas, if there's a game that you've been wanting me to cover for a long time, uh, go ahead and suggest that, and maybe you'll get lucky. As always, I want to thank everyone who has supported uh, the show. I've noticed uh, some people have been uh, submitting links to Reddit. I saw some uh, tweets about it. I saw some uh, people have been posting on forums about the show. That's really, really great, guys. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. You know, I, I could try to do it myself, but uh, people just consider it, quite rightfully, in my opinion, to be spamming. I don't want to go out there and spam all these sites, so it really means a lot to me if you do it. Uh, that way people know it's from a trusted <laughs> source, and they'll be more likely to check it out anyway. So thank you, and also uh, thanks to everyone who has donated to the show. Uh, that, of course, is very important uh, to me, and I can't thank you enough. So thanks a lot, guys. Uh, now about that ale of the week. Let's see what we've got on the shelf today. I have a Alaskan barley wine ale. And I'm not actually sure what a barley wine ale is. Um, <laughs> so this will be kind of a new experience. Uh, this is uh, brewed by the, uh, let's see, Pilot Series bronze medal winner. Well, apparently uh, somebody likes it. Uh, who is the brewing company? Oh. Alaskan Brewing Company, guess that would make sense. Uh, that is in, uh, let me see, where would the Alaskan Brewing Company be located? Uh, Juneau, Minnesota, no, <laughs> Alaska. Okay, let's see what the alcohol content is here. 10.7%, uh, <laughs> holy cow. <laughs> so I should have should have had this before, the, uh, before doing the match, I'd had a, a totally different episode. All right, well, let me open this and uh, give it a go. You know, I have to be really careful with these to get, the, to get them all in one take, because I don't have another uh, barley wine ale sitting back there somewhere. Now, open this with my handy multi-tool. And there's two things a man, a gentleman, I should always have on his person. One is, of course, a multi-tool, and the other is, of course, a drinking horn. Okay, let's give it a go. be kind of fun uh, next time I teach it. I'm actually on sabbatical this year, but I think it'll be pretty fun next uh, semester to come in wearing my drinking horn. <laughs> I wonder what the, uh, the students would think about that. Uh, might find myself lots and lots of free time. Okay. Uh, no, I don't really notice much of a much of a smell here. Let's. Uh, hmm. Well, it's very, uh, very sweet, sort of syrupy, I would say. A little cherry, maybe a little, uh, a little chocolatey. It's very kind of a dark, uh, rich flavor to this. A little more subtle than I would think with 10.7%. Uh, I was kind of expecting to be like, ah, you know, that alcohol uh, backlash. But this is uh, actually pretty smooth. Ah. It's quite tasty. I like this. You know, if, I know some of you guys out there know more about beer than I do, so be, uh, if you could tell me what a barley wine ale is, I'd appreciate it. I'd like to, I'd like to know about these things. Okay, let's get to the uh, quotation and put an end to this episode. I'll get back to my barley wine. And uh, this quotation comes from a great artist, and I thought it was really appropriate 
uh, way to end this uh, series of interviews with Mark. And it goes something like this. All children are artists. The problem is how to remain one once you grow up. See you guys next week.